Having spent so many years arguing with Boeing over their airplanes, particularly all the 707s, and most particularly of the 727, it was an enormous relief to me to be able to fly the 74 and conclude at the end that apart from one small point, it was by miles the best aeroplane I'd ever flown. Now, when you see a 74 on the ground, particularly if you walk up to it, it is simply enormous. It's a vast aeroplane. When I flew it, I did some test work at um, 825,000 pounds. I actually did an engine out takeoff at, at 825,000 pounds. And that's the best part of 400 short tons, if you can imagine that amount of metal going into the air. But once it's in the air, it flies like a bird. The control forces are light. They're more powered. In, yes, they're fully powered all round. Um, I talked earlier about the 707, where in the very worst cases, the rudder foot loads could be up to 200 and 220 pounds. In the 747, the maximum possible rudder foot force is 70 pounds, which is a piece of cake. Anybody can push 70 pounds. The stick forces for manoeuvring are very light. The centering over small angles is immaculate. The aileron loads are light. You can work them comfortably with one hand. And the centering over small angles is immaculate again. So the fact that you've got 400 short tons strapped to you is of no consequence whatsoever. You simply fly the aeroplane and you can fly it with enormous precision and very gentle control forces. The one exception which I'll come back to, I will just leave for the moment, the stability of the aeroplane is immaculate all round. The controllability is immaculate. The stall qualities are immaculate. All the other qualities, ability to trim, are all totally without criticism. It is a joy to fly, and it is so easy and so simple to fly that if you took a schoolboy of 16 who could ride a motorbike and had enough courage, you could put him in the left seat and he would do a, a circuit and landing for you without any trouble at all. It is that easy. When I came back from the States and, and went about saying this, of course the airline pilots hated it because they like the world to believe that flying is a great art and that is hard work and, and people should, you know, value and trust the uh, skill and competence that they put into flying. In the case of the 74, that simply isn't true. Some things about it are so good. In the old days, if you went to high mark number in any of the old-fashioned aeroplanes, they pitched down. And of course, if you don't look after the aeroplane, the more it pitches down, the faster it goes, the higher is the mark number, and the deeper into trouble you go. In the case of the 74, it has an enormously high MDF, Maximum Demonstrated Flight Diving Mark Number. It is actually 0.98, which is two hundredths of a mark, is it not, from Mark 1. And yet... It is no problem. You go up to 45,000 feet, stuff it downhill, take it all the way up to 9.8, not much more, because if you did, you wouldn't do any damage, but you'd make the biggest bang over Seattle you ever heard in your uh -huh. life. Uh, you go up to 9.8, and everything the book says that you should be able to do with that aeroplane you can do. It's got masses of roll rate. It's still stable. You can pull G. You can do anything like, and it's as smooth as a whisker. There's not a trace of buffet at 98 mark number. You can't believe that you are damn nigh supersonic in such a big lump of machinery. Of course, the flow over the wing in different places is supersonic at that number. There are two points worth making. Before the aeroplane flew, and knowing what a nut I was on stall qualities, Boeing having worked with me for so many years on previous aeroplanes, their chief designer came to me and said, I want an agreement with you before we signed a contract to sell this aeroplane to BOAC. I said, well, what do you want to know? He said, this aeroplane will have perfect stall qualities, except with the flaps up. With the flaps and the slats fully up, he said it won't pitch down. Now, having said that, he said it won't pitch up either. It'll just sit there looking at you. But it'll be buffeting itself to death. He said, we are forecasting enormous buffet at max incidents with the flaps up. And he said, will you buy that? And I said, yes. I said, I'm not a nut. You don't, you don't have to go mad to satisfy me. I said, the heart of the requirement is that a pilot shall know when he's at the store. 
so that he can make a decent recovery. I said, if you promise me that this thing will have vast and unmistakable buffet, I'll buy it like a shot. And he said, done. That's what it'll do. So the years went by. The aeroplane got designed, built, test flown. It was even certificated again by the FAA before we got at it. I did about a 30-hour program on it, and really, it was a pleasure and a joy to fly. Two things. When we came to the stall, the simple thing is to work up from gear down full flap. With the gear down and full flap, the machine buffets and then pitches nose down. Then as the, when you pull the gear up and get the flaps up a bit higher, the buffet is uh, increased. And when you get to the slightest bit of flap, which is a titchy bit of trailing edge flap, titchy bit of leading edge flap, the pitch down is still there, but it's not very marked, but it is there, and the buffet is quite strong. When you get to max CL, which is the stalling point, the machine will pitch down. So that's great. Now, when you come to the flaps fully up, the machine will go all the way to the stall. The stick force to stall is still positive. You've still got to keep pulling to get slower and slower, which shows positive stability. And then it starts to buff it. And it starts to buff it at quite a high speed, something like 1.2 VS, which is 20% uh, above the stall. And then the buffet builds up. Now, they told me that it would buff it very violently. And I said, is the buffet structurally damaging? And they said, no, you can go right to the stall. Don't lose courage. Go all the way to the stall. And when you see the speed that we quote as the stall, that's it. And if you are satisfied that a pilot would have to be dead before he realized he was at the stall, then push the stick forward and recover. I said, okay. So I started to slow down, and the buffet started to get strong. Now, I've experienced buffet before. I think I mentioned the DCH-63. Oh, God, the buffet was terrible. But the Boeing puts them all in the shade. With the flaps up, the stall buffet on the 747 is quite, quite astronomical. It builds up to such an extent that you can't believe it. You are bouncing up and down in your seat, and, and your, your bottom is actually leaving. Or it, in spite of the fact you pull in tight, you can feel yourself leaving the seat cushion about twice every second. So that, that's your eyeball frequency, is it? Ah, no, you've got to, it can get like that. <laughs> but the whole thing is bouncing like this. And when you think you can't stand it any longer, you realise you've got about another one or two knots to go, depending on the weight, to this magic stall speed, you see. And just as you get there, and you can't bear it any longer, not only is it bouncing up and down, but it suddenly takes a nasty sideways move, motion as well. So you finish up being shaken rather like a terrier would shake a rat, only on a much faster scale. And you think, oh, I can't stand this. And then you look at the airspeed indicator and you are there. This is the magic speed Boeing said you, you should achieve. So you push the stick forward. Now, while this buffet is going on, if you look at the instruments, you cannot read any one of them because all the needles are going like this. And in fact, when we recovered, I expected all the needles to be in the bottom of the case, but they weren't, they were still there. And when we recovered, all the instruments settled down, EPR, you know, SB, altitude, the whole thing was working. It took a long time to come out of it, mind, because like all these big aeroplanes at high incidence, you don't recover immediately, you push the stick forward. It takes time for a big aeroplane to pitch down, pick up airspeed, and clean up the airflow. So you've got to be patient, you've got to pitch it down and get on with it. So we did that, and it recovered. Now, I, I've forgotten who I had in the right seat, some decent egg. He said, what do you make of that? Would you buy that? I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> now, it really was out of this world. Now, just as a little aside to that, when I came home, I talked to BYC about it, and I said, you're going to love this aeroplane, it's great. We did some series checks on the new aeroplanes as they were delivered, and on one occasion, there was a BOAC pilot in the right seat, one of the training captains, and he said, I've heard a great deal about this um, flaps up buffet. He said, uh, would you do a stall and show me? I said, yeah. And then I found myself briefing him like Boeing briefed me. Dizzy Neville, I think it was. And I said, now listen, Dizzy. I said, this is going to frighten you. I'm not kidding. You'll be, you'll be horrified. But don't worry. And I said, whatever you do, don't touch anything. Just sit there. And he said, okay, then. I believe you. So I did a, a flaps up stall for him. He was appalled. He couldn't believe it. Neither could the flight engineer, neither could anybody else on the flight deck. 
And a couple of days later, I had a little note from BYC which said, please don't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> but I asked Boeing at the time, because you see, practical stall demonstrations were still part of our training over here. I said, will you object to pilots being taught to fly the airplane doing stalls, flaps up stall? They said, no, you may stall the airplane flaps up. It showed their degree of confidence in it. So that was one good thing. The only snag we had on the 74 was that. And it's, it, this is a bit of an academic case. If you go to very low speed with power on in a climb and get slower and slower and slower, the aeroplane became a little bit longitudinally unstable, which meant that it pitched up very gently towards the stall. Now, it did this because the thrust line, having underslung engines, was low down, and it tends to pitch you like so. It was quite weak. The push force when you got to the stall, well, maybe it was six or seven pounds. It was, in effect, a leftover from the 336707, because the high-lift leading edge devices had been carried right in close to the fuselage. And, of course, Boeing knew what I was going to say. When we landed, I said, I'm not having the pre-stall stability power on flaps up. They said, no, we knew that. We knew you'd say that. And they said, now, before you make a song and dance about it, we got a fix. I said, great, what is it? And they said, it's called a nudger. Exactly the same thing they put on the 336. When the stick shake goes off, this little thing comes in, winds up a spring, puts a stick force in the control column, and recovers the airplane. And again, cost about top and signy. So they fitted that. It's not on the American airplanes. It's only on the British airplanes. But it's in the 100 and the 200 series. It works beautifully. But because it's a gadget, which Boeing don't like in principle, they like something more elegant and built in than that, it has been replaced on the 400 series, which is the current one, with what is called speed trim. As you get very slow on the 400 now, uh, an electronic circuit measuring incidents and everything will come in and it will gently move the, st the tail plane to give you positive longitude and stability. Now then, the only other difference on the 74 from conventional aeroplanes is that it doesn't have a side opening window for the pilot. One of the main reasons for a side opening window is that in an emergency, if you have a bird strike, if you hit a big bird, the carcass is splatted over the thing and nothing will shift it, you see, not even windscreen wash and wipers all the blood and guts it congeals on there. Or you could have a screen pitted with hail and absolutely frosted so that you can't see through. There is a simple requirement which says you must be able to land an aeroplane without forward vision through the pilot's main panel. So I said to Boeing, you haven't got a side window, how are you going to do it? And they said, you can look through this window with it, sh with it well, I mean, it's shut, it wouldn't open. You can look through this window and land the aeroplane. And I it said, has a side window, but not, not an opening one. Yes, yeah. it has a. It, it, there's the main screens, and there's the side windows, except they don't open, whereas they do on most other airplanes. Mm. But it's also right back. Yes, it is. The rear frame. Yes, mm. and when you go like this, you you can almost kid yourself. You could see straight ahead. So again, you see, in spite of all this fuss with Boeing, I believe in their hearts. They were very fond of me. They were very flattering when I retired. Sent me a big present and a lovely cartoon. Uh, so I said to the guy in the right seat, now, at the end of today's flight, we're going to do a side window landing. I said, I want a big piece of cardboard that we can put on the front screen, stick it on, to completely obscure the front view, so there'd be no cheating. And you see, I've done this on Tridents and V's. I've done it on every airplane I've flown. I must be the only guy in the world who's actually done all these things. And they said, yeah, we know all about that. So they cut a big sheet of cardboard, and then come the time... I found that by leaning over and using my left eye only, I could, if I did a curving approach onto the runway, and this is in the 7-4 mine, mm. bloody great aeroplane, I could actually see the runway, not necessarily the runway centre line, but I could see the left-hand edge. And all you need to see is enough to keep straight. But I couldn't reach the throttles. Now that didn't matter, because it takes two guys to fly an aeroplane sometimes. So we had a briefing before the flight, and I said, look, when we come back for this landing, I will fly a visual approach, but I will leave the handling of the throttles to the co-pilot, 
with an instruction as to what I want him to do, i.e. fiddle with the throttles and keep me at my required airspeed, shall we say 135 knots. So we set the machine up, I went downwind, across wind, and then started to come in. We had the gear down, full flap, I was jammed right up against this window like this, but I could see the runway, and I flew a perfectly visual approach, looking at the left-hand edge of the runway, with complete confidence that this guy had um, kept me at 135 knots. Of course, he could see, you see, through his window, which wasn't obscured. And I say, when I say cut, close the throttle. So he said, OK, he did exactly what I asked. We came round the corner, we came down, and then when I was lined up, and I deliberately landed a bit to starboard of the centre line to give me a bit more view, and then when I was happy with the aeroplane, I said, cut, and he cut the throttles, the machine went down, put the stick forward, brake gently, and we stopped in a dead straight line. But it had Category 3B auto land on it, didn't it? Not then it didn't. Ah. No, it has since, yes. Mm. But so you see, this was this was years ago, you know. Ah. The 74 has been in service for years. But you see, it, it was part of our philosophy to demonstrate on everybody's aeroplane every survivable emergency condition. Engine out takeoffs, engine out landings, two engine out landings, flapless landings, stuck stabilizer landings. I mean, flapless, flapless landings on Tridents and BC-10, you had a threshold speed of 180 knots. Well, hell's teeth, that's not half going. Mind you, it, it wasn't so bad on a Trident, you could actually do that into Hatfield on a Trident, because you had reverse thrust, which was enormously effective. Now, you had reverse thrust on a VC-10, but it wasn't so effective, because you had to be on the ground on a VC-10 before you could pull reverse. In the Trident, you could pull reverse in the flare. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the higher the airspeed at which you pull reverse, the more effective it is. At very low speed, reverse thrust is hardly worth the noise of using it. And the stress. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. And, and uh, what is your threshold speed on 747? You mean uh, with with what? Over, well, over the culverts, how fast do you come? You, you uh, mean in an ordinary landing? ordinary landing. Oh, yeah. around about 135 knots. As low as that? Oh, yes. Good heavens. Oh, yes. It, it's great. That. No, no, it's a piece yeah. of cake. Mm -hmm. The other thing about a 74, and this is exactly true of a Concorde, which we'll cover later, is that to, to land the aeroplane, a visual ordinary landing, you simply don't have to do anything except close the throttles. Mm. Because you are very high up in the air, and when you first fly it, you don't really know where the main gear is, except that it's like a hundred miles behind you and a long way down below. It's miles away, the main gear. Of course, you've got radio height to help you, and the way to fly is to bring the thing in on a glide path or a visual landing, it doesn't make any difference. And when you get down to just below 50 feet, you whittle the throttles back. You don't whop them shut. You just shiggle them back, taking about two or three seconds to come to idle. Now, as you do that, the machine will want to pitch nose down very gently. Again, because you were taking away the thrust from underneath, you see, when you throttle back. And all you do is resist the nose down pitch. You don't actually flare, but you don't let the nose go down. You hold your hand there and do nothing else. You shiggle the throttle strut. The machine descends, and a few seconds later, there's a little gentle rumbling noise, and you're down. It's actually on the ground. And then all you do is put the stick forward. And I can't be more flattering about the 74 than I have mm. been. It's a super aeroplane. Yeah. Can I ask you some questions? On yes. That? Well, yeah. Um, first, first of all, um, the wing sweep is steeper than a 707, isn't it? It is a bit. So presumably that helped getting up to Mach 9.8. Yes, it would. Um, but the other thing I don't understand is, first of all, how the first 707 was such cows, when you think that Boeing had swept wing experience, in, in fact the same layout, not only swept wings, but engines in pods, yeah. from the B-47 through, the, through to the B-52. Yeah. You would have thought they would have got it right on those two aircraft. Yes, you would have. Mind you, the B-47 was a bit different. It was a long, thin body. It had a yeah. fore and aft gear. Remember? And wing tip Bicycle, thing. Tandem yes. gear, yeah, and yes. little, little outriggers. Yes, it yeah. did. It was yeah. so, somewhat different. Yeah. What was the other one you mentioned? 52. The, the big, big one. one. Yes. With Mind you, I don't think that was a, a high mark aeroplane. No. No, I don't believe for a moment. But the 70, you could demonstrate 95 mark number in it, but you couldn't do much when you got there. Uh. There was hardly any roll rate left. It was buffeting itself to death. Um, the elevator effectiveness had virtually gone to zero. It was a heap. 
9.5 was demonstrable but not usable. But it was okay. The book said you've got to be able to show that you can go there and come back. Mm. And that's what you could do. But you see, they, they learnt so much to, to, to make this huge contrast between the 707, which was a horror aeroplane when you first got into it, yeah. through to the 747, which you praised. Yes. Now, presumably they were going up a learning curve. Yes. Forget the 727 at the moment, different different wing, because it had no, no engines on That's it. That's right. But 737, yeah. uh, they got right. Yes, they did. Now, 747 was built with government money as part of the C5A programme, wasn't it? I don't Lockheed know. Lockheed got the, got the contract. This they did. This, this was this gigantic step upwards in size. Yes, right? it was. Now, a lot of uh, 747 design was done on computers, in Slough of all places. Was it? I believe, yeah. Huh. It was all um, worked out. Yeah. Uh, because you'd reached that level of sophistication in computer technology. Yes. That instead of actually cutting metal, they could forecast an awful lot of characteristics yeah. by running a computer program on it. I would believe that, because remember what I said about the stalls? Yeah. That's right. That's what I mean. Yes. This, this is some of the magic that came yes. through the metal when they, yes. when they built the aeroplane. Now, let, let me tell you one other thing. I always made a practice of doing an engine out takeoff at max weight on every aeroplane I flew. Every aeroplane. Because it is the most limiting case, is it not? We did an engine, and a Boeing, they knew this, and in fact they were so confident that they never did it themselves. They knew that Di Davis would do it regardless, you see, when they got there. And it's very expensive doing this very, very high weight work. So they said, look, don't bother. Davis will do it when he comes and we'll measure it. So we set it up at Moses Lake, which is their test base out in the sticks. Terribly long. It's 16,000 feet, which is, you know, over three miles. And uh, it was a cold day, which was good in a way. The aeroplane was full up with ballast. We took off out of uh, Seattle at 700,000 pounds. We landed at Moses at about 650,000, or even maybe more. Cool, that's a high weight. Yes, it is. Miles above max landing weight. Yeah. But see, Boeing don't mind. If they know, if they got confidence in the guy flying the aeroplane, you just get on with it. You just held it off for longer, did you? No, we, we just put it down very gently, and it did. It went down like a bird. We taxied to the refueling point. This tickled me. And um, they filled it up to the gunnels. It was full of fuel. It was full of ballast. It was up to the eyebrows. Now, you know the 7-4 has a bulge behind the flight deck. Of course, it's much longer now. Mm -hmm. They put about f umpteen passengers up there these days. But in those days, it was just a little cabin. And, of course, a test aeroplane is not furnished. It's got water ballast tanks all over the place. We were sitting up there having an early lunch. Always the same. PBJ sandwiches. You know what that is. Peanut butter and jam. I didn't <laughs> like it much. But we were eating this. And then when it was full... The chief ground engineer came up and said, OK, the aeroplane's ready to fly. I said, well, what's the weight? And he laughed. He said, you can take your pick, he said. I've got five different weights. He said, five blokes have worked the takeoff weight out, and they all differ. He said, it's around 800 and something, something, something. So I said, well, I tell you what to do. I said, take an arithmetical mean of what they all say. Now, th this varied from about 820 to about 828. So it came out about 825.5. So I said, OK, that's the takeoff weight. And Boeing agreed with that. It was the best anybody could do. So we taxied that. <clears throat> By Jove, you could tell it was heavy. When you taxi a big aeroplane right up to max weight, it, it, you know, it's ponderous is a good word. But we taxied that. We got lined up. We had a proper briefing as to who would do what. Because the departure flight path at max weight is a very complicated thing. After takeoff, you've got to pull the gear You've got to raise the flaps in sequence according to time and height. And this was, after all, an academic exercise which was going to be photographed and measured precisely. And it all finishes five minutes after takeoff, because you're not allowed to hold takeoff power for more than five minutes at 5,000 feet, at which point the aeroplane is cleaned up and you are just entering the engine out en route climb phase. And I had a marvellous performance engineer, a bloke called Bill Horsley. So I said, OK, well, now we're going to fly the aeroplane exactly as we've agreed, and you measure everything. And, of course, everybody else measured everything. They were all eyes. So we, we fired it up, full power. And as soon as the EPR was settled, start the stopwatch. Brakes off, down we went. Now, we were 825,000 pounds, which is a fantastic weight. V1 was going to be 165 knots. VR was going to be about 175 V2 was about 186, and then the, the flap, the initial flap retraction speed 
was 206, the next bit of flap was 216, the next bit was 230, and so it went on. We had to have a guy checking this. So we set off. The machine went like a bird, straight down the runway. At 100, whatever I said, 165, number four was idled. The deviation was nothing. And of course, it, it wouldn't be, would it, at those speeds? We were way above the limiting airspeed for control. All I needed was a little touch of rudder and a little, about an inch of wheel. Then 176 knots came up, a gentle rotation to about 12 degrees pitch attitude. See, you fly by numbers, 12 degrees, lifted it off. And the moment we saw a positive rate of climb, gear up, let it increase to whatever. There was a noise abatement climb speed of 196 knots. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Did, it, did it happen in the desert? Oh, we had to fly it exactly as though it was going out of London. Even with this huge load? Yes, oh yes. And we I was going to ask you as a joke, actually. Oh, no, no. You had to do the whole thing properly. Oh, and then um, when we got to 206 at whatever, 500 feet, the first bit of flap came up, accelerate the aeroplane. Anyway, we followed it precisely. And when we came up to 5,000 feet, just coming up to 256 knots, the last bit of flap came up, and I was ready to enter the on-route climb by coming back and climbing at 256. And I said to Bill, stop. And he stopped the watch, and that was the end of the takeoff, because the takeoff is not complete until the aeroplane is cleaned up. And uh, I said, well, how long was that? Just rather jokingly. And he said, four minutes, 46 seconds. I said, what happened to the other 14 seconds? And because you see, it was supposed to be five minutes. He, and he laughed. He said, look, that is because when we shut that engine down, we idled it. We didn't take the fuel off, see, just in case we had another failure. And that was the difference. That idle thrust enabled us to do the departure within the time allowance of 14 seconds for the idle thrust. The aeroplane did exactly what Boeing said it would do, to within a foot of altitude, a knot of airspeed, and a second of time. I've never been so impressed in my life. The, the, the fact that you didn't have a totally dead engine then didn't invalidate that. Too. No, it didn't, because... Boeing's forecast allowed for an, an engine at idle. Ah. You see, at max weight, you wouldn't chance your arm by shutting the engine down. Because, had we lost another engine, low down, we would have crashed before we could have relit that one. And that's not on. It's easier to make a calculation which allows for the idle thrust, and then fly the program. What percentage thrust would an idle engine be putting up? Well, at, that, at, at those air speeds, Hell, it would be nothing. It would be a couple of thousand, or I don't know, but a thousand pounds of thrust. Yeah. Mm. You see, they were, they were about fifty thousand pound thrust engines, because mm. that was a two hundred series with the RB two LM. But uh, you know, my admiration for Boeing now, now, is uh, virtually you know limitless. What Boeing tell you, the airplane will do, it will do, and you can believe it and trust it. And I wouldn't grant any other constructor that privilege of believing them. Not because other people would tell you an untruth. It would be simply that they wouldn't know to the degree of accuracy that Boeing know what the 7-4 will do. When I travel, I would always prefer to travel 7-4, even by a second or third rate operator. Because, uh, I've said it several times, a boy of 16 could fly a 7-4. It's a super aeroplane. And now, it's so capable with all the automatics. I mean, it will do auto land, and, e and you, it's got automatic brake. I mean, before you land, you can dial up what degree of braking you want, and the moment the wheels touch the ground, the brakes come on, and they anti-skid at whatever level you, you've accepted. Keeps dead straight. There's yeah. real steering on auto land as well. Oh, yes, the, you've got the whole whack. It does the whole thing for you. Uh -huh. Can I ask you a bit now about, still on, on the 707-747 comparison, and that is... Um, uh, Engine control. Uh, now, on the 436, you had Conway, single shaft, yes. compa compared to the triple shaft RV211. Mm. Now, presumably a triple shaft engine, you can just slam the throttle forward and it's just like a car engine, it responds instantly. Uh, Did you have to wait a long time on the Conways for full response once you opened the tap? No, you didn't. No, it came up pretty well instantaneously. Oh. Incidentally, you have to wait a bit on the 7.4, with Conway's. What well, with the RB211s? With the RB211 and with the Pratt & Whitney, what was it, JT9D? JT9D, yes. yes. You have to wait a bit, and the reason is, 
that the acceleration unit is deliberately slugged to accommodate the characteristics of the engine. If you took that unit out of service and what the throttle open, you choke the engine to death. When you select the throttle fully open, and you can whop it open, you can get hold of it and go pow, but the throttle unit in the bowels of the airplane opens at its programmed rate, and it takes five seconds to go from idle thrust to full thrust. Doesn't matter, you can whop the throttle as fast as you like, it will still take five seconds to get full thrust. And that's true of all these big aeroplanes. You know, an Air France pilot made a cock of a Airbus demonstration in France where he finished up in the trees. Well, of course, he did about 14 different things wrong. He wouldn't accept it because he's a very cocky autocratic pilot. But he made more mistakes than you can shake a stick at on that go around. He left it too late and he got very slow. And when he opened the throttles, he expected the power to be there. Now, the, pa the engine acceleration unit said to him, you can have full power, but it'll take five seconds. And in that time, he just clipped the trees, and then the trees dragged him down. It takes five seconds to achieve full thrust on a big fan. Full stop. Because the other thing, of course, is, is, is the um, inertia of the fan. Yes, which is because huge. Because it's got a huge air loading. Poof, I should say. I mean, I, I don't know what the tonnage of cold air is that the fan pushes off now on, the, on these engines, oh, but it must be immense. It must be, yes. And a loaded fan like that, even yeah. forget about spinning it. Yeah. Static. Yeah. Which you can do. I mean, you just grab it and presume yeah. you spin it. But uh, if, if it's if all all the blades are tightened up and they're on their full load. Yeah. Uh, the, yes. But you see, Boeing had trouble with decelerations and accelerations of all the big fan engines, mm -hmm. whether they were Pratt & Whitney or, or things. And there is a very critical test on a big engine at high altitude. They call it a bogey. It's actually an interrupted deceleration. You close the throttle, and then as the engine starts to unwind, you change your mind and you open it up again. And the engine tends to cough or hesitate. And you, they have to put all sorts of elegant laws into the acceleration unit. And everybody knew this. They have had some trouble. But by the time we got to the aeroplane, it was all sorted. And I've spent hours at altitude with, with the machine on autopilot and trying to fox the engine and the uh, acceleration units. Mm -hmm. And by the time it's sorted out, you can't. Mm -hmm. they, they work. It doesn't work. You can get hold of that throttle and go absolutely mad. You can go like this with it. And the engine says, when this silly bugger has finished mucking about with the throttle, I'll give him the power he wants. It, it's as simple as that. And that's how it works. Can you tell me something about the uh, problems you encountered in T-tail aircraft, i.e. the VC-10, 111, Trident, that family? Ah, uh, yes. The, the first of those was the Trident. And halfway through the development program, there was an aerodynamicist at Hatfield called uh, David Newman. And he came to me one day and said that they were having trouble with the stall characteristics of the aeroplane. It started to pitch up towards the stall, whereas, of course, the requirements demand and good common sense demands that an aeroplane shall pitch down at the stall. Anyway, they eventually spent 12 months in the middle of this development program looking at the stall fixes, and there weren't any aerodynamic fixes. The plan form of the wing and the wing sections were both such that the machine had significant pitch up at very high incidence close to the stall. And they simply couldn't fix it. It is too big a demand to put a new wing on a prototype aeroplane, which would be the proper fix, the proper aerodynamic fix. But in the end, they came to me and said, could we use a stick push-up? Now, I knew roughly what they were up to. I knew what a stick pusher did. And I said, yes, we will accept a stick pusher as a device, A, to identify the stall, and B, to pitch the aeroplane nose down at the stall, provided that the reliability of the system is as good as it needs to be. And he said, how good does it need to be? Now then, if you know that a stall shouldn't lose an aeroplane more often than one in ten million, if you multiply the frequency of stalling, which is approximately one in a hundred thousand, by 
the number of times that the stick pusher could fail and lead to the loss of the airplane, the answer comes out as one in a hundred. So when you design a stick pusher, it needn't be any more reliable than a failure rate of one in a hundred, which sounds pretty weedy and pretty low. And because most people have a bit of a conscience about it, they design it to a much higher standard so that you eventually come out with a device which wouldn't fail, it wouldn't even fail once in a thousand times. And remember, these thousand times have got to be the times when the machine is actually stalling. So it wasn't any trouble to get a stick pusher to be sufficiently reliable. Now having said that, they fitted a stick pusher and did some development flying. I had to go up to Hatfield and fly this program and it was the first of my stick pushing programs. It worked perfectly well. It measures incident, incidents. It also measures rate of change of incidents. And if you come up to the stall quickly, the stick pusher will push early to stop you over swinging into a pitch up condition. And whatever we did to it, it worked. And we finished up at the end of that program with a very violent stall. It was so violent that one wouldn't have dreamt of doing it on a conventional aeroplane. But because this aeroplane had a device in place of a natural feature, there was a sort of conservative wish to prove the device to its ultimate point and to make damn sure that it would always work. And the most demanding stall is an accelerated stall where you go into a steep turn and pull the stick hard back. That's all you do. And in a big aeroplane, it's a bit, bit hairy. But the Trident behaved perfectly. Didn't uh, drop a wing on it. Absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. It remained dead level. And then as it came up to the stall, which was at 1.8 G, which is a hell of a load factor, the pusher pushed, and it was a super pusher. It just went smash. The stick went hard forward. The aeroplane pitched down and recovered. Well, we, when, when the nose comes up to this alarming angle, yeah. presumably forward airspeed decays at a very rapid rate. Yes, it does. Mm. Yes. But remember, if you stall, if say an aeroplane stalls at, at 1G at 100 knots, mm. if you do an accelerated stall at 1.8G, it'll stall at about 140 knots. So the nose isn't that high. Okay, so the Trident was cleared. The VC-10 was the next aeroplane. And Vickers, they, they made a small mistake on that because Trump came to me and he said, we are going to have to fit a stick pusher from the beginning. He said, we know this aeroplane will pitch up like mad. So they fitted a pusher. And one day Trump said to me, well, come down and fly it. So I went down to fly it. And it worked all right, but it was quite a slow push. Instead of the Trident going smash, the VC-10 stick went sort of like that, you see. And I said, when we finished the flight, I said to Trub, well, it works all right, but I said, that push is bloody hopeless. He said, what do you mean bloody hopeless? He said, it's bloody marvellous. And he said, we've put it on the elevator, not on the stick. So he said, the elevators go down and the, the control cables pull the stick forward. And I said, ah, now, is that what you've done? I said, now, that's what I don't like. And he said, why? I said, well, because... A pusher not only is supposed to recover the aeroplane, it is supposed to identify to the pilot that he's at the stall. And it must unhesitatingly go smash at the point of stall. And I said, yours doesn't do it. He said, how long do you think it takes to go forward? I said, two tenths of a second. He said, well, what does the Trident do then? He said, you're always saying what a good aeroplane that is. I said, oh, that's about one tenth of a second. And he said, are you telling me you can tell the difference between one-tenth and two-tenths of a second? I said, certainly. I said, it's like half an hour. When you're waiting for something to happen and you're all tuned up to the bloody eyebrows, a delay of one-tenth of a second is an age. And Trump said, oh, I'm not sure I believe that. I said, look, you go up and fly the Trump. Give Cunningham a ring and go and fly. He went up, he flew it, he came back. And he said, by God, you're dead right. He said, we'll have to take ours off the elevator and put it on the stick. So they, they took it off the elevator and they put it on the stick. And not only that, they put a horn in with it so that when the stick push, pushed, 
this horn blew, a very loud horn. The other thing about the VC-10 is that the buffet at the stall is astronomical. And on the VC-10, we finished up with exactly the same final stall, which was as the same one as the Trident. Gear down, full flap, power on, steep turn to the left, pulling hard. And coincidentally, I wasn't shooting for it, but coincidentally, it also came out at 1.8G load factor. And the pandemonium on the flight deck, you couldn't believe. I mean, the wings st still stayed level, but the stick shakers were going, a stall warning. The stick knockers were going. The horn went, and then the stick went bang. But because the rate of pitch was so high, although the stick went hard forward, the machine continued to pitch up for a little bit, like two or three seconds. Then it stopped pitching up, and then it started to pitch down. And all the time, of course, the stick was hard on the forward stop. It was a tremendous stop. And when we recovered from that, I said, well, that's enough of that. That's the end of the program. And Trump said, I should bloody well think so. He said, I've never seen a stall like that in my life before. And I said, well, OK, the, you know, it, it all worked and, and that was it. So they were the two exciting ones. Now, the 111 was also suspected of having pitch up. So BAC or Vickers, whatever they were in those days, they went into it quite slowly. But as you probably know, on one of the prototypes, which had a servo-tabbed elevator, you might remember I told you a servo-tab is where the pilot is not connected to the elevator, he's connected to the tab. And you wiggle the tab and the tab flies the elevator for you. Well, they got into a superstore. This was Mike Lithgow and Dickie Reimer. And of course, it wouldn't recover, not only that, they had about 17 or 18 people on board, which they shouldn't have had. The guys in the back did fire the escape hatch, but it came off and it went back on again, because by this time the airplane was coming down straight, absolutely straight. And of course they were all lost. So... Was the response too slow on, on a tab then? By the time it had transmitted its effect to the uh, free-moving Ah, elevator. well, you see, if you watch my hand out, you take a machine up to high incidence, yeah. and then it starts to sink, and the incidence gets even higher. Yeah. As it does that, the elevator is blown up yeah. because the machine is sinking. Now, what you want is that elevator to go hard down. But because the machine is sinking and the airflow is very low, there's not enough hinge moment on the tab to drive the elevator down. So although the tab is trying to drive it down, the elevator remains blown fully up. So although Mike Lithgow had the stick on the forward stop, mm. the elevator was still up in the air. And that was the end of that airplane. Just in parenthesis, when you go on these flights and get into quite dangerous manoeuvres, I mean, are, are you equipped with parachutes? I mean? uh, no. You see, a lot of ordinary people believe that flight testing military airplanes is very hazardous and that flight testing civil airplanes isn't. Now, the truth is the reverse of that statement, because if you're in even a big military bomber, they have escape capsules, they have ejection seats, and if you lose the place in a military airplane, you can pull the plug and eject. You can't on a civil airplane. You, you, are, you, are, able, you are supposed to be able to get out of them, but the way you get out is to get out of the seat, walk off, let go of the escape hatch and jump out of the bottom of the airplane. But of course it takes bloody ages to do that. Apart from any G-forces that yes. protect you from that's right. That's right. Well, the 111, they fitted a pusher on that mm. and it did exactly the same thing. And we flew the same series of tests and they all worked. But of course, see, the 111 actually went in. They lost it. And Vickers were very good. George Edwards talk to Douglas, who were doing the DC-9 at the same time, and told them all about it. Now, the DC-9, the, no one in America will admit that a, any American aeroplane has a stick push-up, but certainly two of them do, three of them do. The Learjet has a stick push-up, the F-104 has a stick push-up. Now, I know it's a military aeroplane, but you can tell how hairy that is. And uh, the DC-9 also has a stick push-up, but it doesn't necessarily identify CL Max at the stall, but there is a hydraulic system on the DC-9 which says 
that if you hold the stick, no, if you push the stick hard forward to recover from a stall and the aeroplane doesn't respond immediately, if you hold it there for two or three seconds, a stick pusher comes in and drives the elevators harder and then the machine will recover. At the time of the 111 accident, I couldn't understand how um, the pilot couldn't fly himself, power himself out of this situation because I thought that, okay, you can open up a, an engine on the ground in still air and get up to full power relatively quickly before takeoff. Now, what was to prevent you doing that? Ah, because the 111 eventually was coming down this way. Yeah. There's the intake. Yeah. The air wasn't going into it at all. It was it, going it straight was going across it. the front. Yeah. Mm. And so you see... Exactly, there was start of air. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm. Now, the Trident 1, the Trident 1E, I think, or the Trident one. One of them was lost on a production test flight. Some guy, I've forgotten his name, he was a nice chap. But he... George we, Errington was lost on that. Yes, he was. Yeah. He was in the right seat. And of course, he, he shouldn't have been there. He wasn't, he wasn't qualified. Um, this guy did... We used to do production stalls on Trident ones with a pusher inoperative, in one condition, just to make sure that all the wing leading edge devices were accurately set up and you only went as far as the first little beginning of a, a wing drop and then you recovered. Now this guy sailed in a bit quickly. We now believe he thought he was in a Mark 1 instead of a Mark 1E which is a bit more stable and of course he, he went in a bit too deep and they went into a superstorm at about 18,000 feet and they, they couldn't recover and that machine hit the ground coming straight down with all the engines flamed out. Well, but, yeah, um, apart from the, 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 the T-store problems, though, how did those three aircraft actually turn out to fly in normal commercial conditions? Oh, they, they nice were. Airplanes? Well, the, the, my only criticism of the Trident 1 was that it had a very heavy elevator with a very high breakout load. This was to get immaculate centering of the control column to get good stability. It was a leftover from the Comet design philosophy. And every time you flew a Trident, if you wanted to work the elevator, you had to push it out of a notch or pull it out of a notch. And if you relaxed with a stick close to the center, it would go click back into the middle again. It was a bloody pain. And everybody who flew the Trident manually used to fly it on the trimmer. It was, it was too much of an effort to use the elevator. So you trimmed it, and of course when you use the trimmer on a power control system, you keep moving the center point, you see. So it's very easy to fly it on the trimmer. But of course it was a bad thing. Now, having finished the Trident, where the stores were accepted on a stick pusher, it had no failures to comply, not even any significant criticisms. And on the last conference, Tony Fairbrother, the lead flight test engineer, he made a big point of saying to me, are we clear? Do we get a C of A with no carping? And I said, yes, you do, but I've got one carp. He said, what's that? I said, well, you've got the most agricultural elevator I've ever flown. And de Havilland didn't like that a bit. But it was true. It was the sort of elevator you would expect to find on a farm tractor, you know, not on an aeroplane. Now, that was the only point. The VC-10 was a super aeroplane to fly. It, it, they were all quiet, you see, because all the engines were aft. But the VC-10 was a marvellous aeroplane. And you can tell how good, because in those days, BOAC were also operating the Boeing 707, which I've said was a demanding aeroplane. And the guys who came off previous types, like, I don't know, Constellations, DC-7Cs, or whatever, if they failed the course on the 7.0, they were put onto the VC-10. And nobody found the VC-10. I mean, see, this magic schoolboy of 16 that I keep talking about, he could fly a VC-10 without any trouble at all. So what about the 111? Did you like that? Yes. The original 111, the 200, the one yeah. that Freddie Laker bought, he, he kicked the program off, you see, with his first order. That was a sweet little aeroplane. And it also had one other thing which I've never found before. The book says, the Air Wilderness Requirements book says, that a pilot shall be strapped in tight for takeoff and landing, which is good common sense. I mean, including shoulder harness pulled tight. And that he shall be able to, able to reach everything comfortably 
of the controls that he needs on takeoff and landing. Now, on most aeroplanes, there were some controls which you needed on takeoff and landing, like the flap lever. Mind you, the co-pilot normally worked it for you, but it shall be possible for either pilot working alone to complete a takeoff and landing. See, all good words these are. But it was a stretch on some aeroplanes to reach some of the things. You, you could do it, but you had to lean like mad. The 111 200 was a bit like a fighter, a bit like a spit. You could sit in the seat, pull the straps tight, and you didn't have to go any more than that to reach everything. It was the comfiest little aeroplane ever. I've heard it said that, uh, said that it was a touch sensitive in pitch. Yes, On it was. Off, if you pull the stick back too far, you're liable to overshoot and have to correct. Well, yes, you. That was yes, that's right. That that was quite true. But you you rapidly adapt to that. But it was hell of a good aeroplane. Uh, it's the sort of aeroplane which you could make a visual approach in very bad weather if you had to. Mind you, you're not allowed that these days. These old days of just after the war when people used to go scratching into these dreadful airfields using an ADF approach. You don't see any more of that. You've got to fly an ILS and do the whole thing properly. But you could fly a 111 quite slowly. You had a marvellous view and you could sneak into a field in very low vis if you had to. Whereas some of these bigger aeroplanes, you, you couldn't possibly do that. The rest of the 111 was fine. It, it all worked. But you see, why are we on this T-tail and, and stick pushes? Can I complete the story by talking about the 727? Now then, this shows the deviousness and frankly the absolute dishonesty of the FAA and, to my regret, the only time Boeing have ever been dishonest. They weren't dishonest with me, but they were dishonest with the FAA. The 727 was the first Boeing aeroplane with full power controls and three engines at the back. It had a pitch up at the stall at RCG, which would have been fatal. It was later proved to be fatal because the, the uh, one uh, airplane in service was lost in a superstore, which I'll come to in a second. Now then, somehow or other, the FAA and Boeing certificated that airplane between them. Some years later, I was talking to a senior Boeing chap, Dick Rousey, a very old and senior Boeing fellow. We were actually doing the 737, and when we finished with the 73, which was a conventional aeroplane, he talked to me about the 727, and he said, it's a pity you won't accept the 72. I said, what do you mean, wouldn't accept it? I said, you've never offered it to us. He said, oh, well, I didn't mean to say that. He said, we know you won't accept it, because it's got a pitch up at the store. I said, well, what the hell are you not doing operating it, flying it and certificating it? He said, now, he said, look now, don't go into that. He said, but I'd like to you to have a go at it one day. I said, look, Dick, all you've got to do is make an application and I'll come over and fly it. So, Dan Air, I think it was Dan Air, wanted a 727-100, the short-bodied one. So we went over and we flew it. Now... The test pilot, Lou Warwick, hell of a good guy, he came to me one day, all this, you know, is frightfully private really, he said, there's not a hope in hell of you accepting this aeroplane. He said, we've had two of the most hairy ass bloody stores you've ever seen in your life. But he said, we've got to go through the motions. He said, come, he said, the stall is the only thing you're going to grumble about. He said, the rest of the aeroplane is great. So he said, we'll do one forward CG flight and one half CG flight. He said, it's okay at Ford CG, it's, it's an ordinary aeroplane, it'll pitch down. He said, you can pull the ass off it, it won't get upset. But he said, when we come to our CG, you'll be given an incidence limit on a dial. And he said, you don't go beyond that. You go up to that and then push and recover. And he said, by that time, you are to tell us whether you have seen any quality which will warn you that you're coming to a stall I mean, the stick shaker accepted. I said, OK, Lou, we'll do it. So we flew the Ford CG program, and it was a piece of cake. It just stalled. And I did some very dynamic stalls, but it was great. Now, when we came to RCG, I was absolutely amazed. 
We set the aeroplane up and trimmed it. I started coming back to the stall, watching the incidents go up. The aeroplane did nothing. Most aeroplanes will buff it as you get close to the stall. This, well, to be fair to this one, with the flaps up, it'll buff it a little bit. But with the flaps out, like take off flap, gear up, there was nothing. It was as smooth as a whistle. It, it, there was no flow breakaway on the wing at all. And, um, but the incidents went up and up. And then the push, the pull force disappeared and the stick went back into the middle, and then it started to pitch up, and I had to push gently. Now, it wasn't a violent pitch up, but it started to rise, and I had to push and push and push, until the stick was halfway forward, which meant I only had that much more to go. And as I got to that point, we came to the incident's limit. And I looked at Lou, and he looked at me, and he was dead pan. He didn't say or do anything, he just sat there. So I put the stick forward, and we recovered. And we opened up and went back up to, whatever, 17,000 feet. And he said, well, what do you think? I said, well, there's nothing there, Lou. I mean, nothing. Not only nothing, the machine is quite desperately unstable. He said, I know. He said, I know all this. But he said, well, let's finish the program. So we, we did it flaps up and we did it flaps down. And there was nothing in the airplane. You simply couldn't go beyond this magic limit. So we came back and told Bonnie. And they said, okay then wheel fit a pusher. Now I'm compressing a lot of time into a short space and we said okay so when you fitted the pusher we'll come back. Took them about eight months that's all and you know it was the best stick pusher I've ever flown. It was much simpler than our systems and yet it was fully duplicated. It did everything it should have done. We took this aeroplane which remember we were all terrified of before. We flew every stall in the book and every time the incidents came up, the stick pusher went pow and recovered the airplane. Now, the worst stall on that airplane was, I mean, the most frightening to the pilot, which was me, wasn't gear down full flap, power on to the left. It was flaps up, power on to the right. Now, if you think of a 7.2 with a lot of thrust and a lot of power on, it's not full power, but it's a lot of power, and you're going to do a 30 degree bank turn and stall the aeroplane, the machine comes up like this. All you can see is blue sky. I hate turning to the right. You see, if you do it to the left, you can always see the ground or the water down there, and visually it's stabilizing. But a turn to the right leaves you looking at a beautiful blue sky with no visual reference, apart from your instrument. And on the first one, I chickened out. As we were just coming up to the stall, I thought, Christ, this aeroplane is up like this. What the hell is it going to do? So I recovered. Lou Wallach didn't say a word. He just sat there like this. So I thought, as I had years before on the Britannia, I think I told you, what am I paid for? I'm up here to do this. So I got again on and do it. So we did, we did it again. And as I came up to the stall, I just kept going. I pulled the stick hard back. And the pusher pushed and the machine recovered perfectly in this climbing, desperate turn. And that was the end of that program. So, can I just interrupt you a minute? Yeah. Going back when you were talking about stop before they fitted the stick pusher on the 100, uh, you said that you couldn't exceed that point. No. The limiting pitch up. When you say you couldn't exceed, you couldn't even pull the stick back hardly. If you no. Exceeded. If you did it in slow flight, yeah. just as you came up to that point, yeah. the pusher pushed. Yeah. See, the pusher was measuring instantly. But before you had the pusher, when you flew it manually. Yes. There was a limiting pitch up you yeah. talked about. Yeah. Could you exceed that in fact? Oh cranky, yes. But you just didn't. No. If this was a conscious decision yes. that held That's you right. Or oh, if you let yeah. the aeroplane go, yeah. it would have gone to a very high incidence and then super stoned into the ground. Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Sorry, continue. Well, mm. the rest of the seven two was a gift. It is one of the nicest airplanes I've ever flown. See, when Boeing finally take a deep breath and decide to do something, they do it well. They did the power controls on the 7-2 terribly well. They did the pusher well. Although it stuck in their craw a bit, you see, because they were only doing it for the UK. They weren't doing it for the States. But the 7-2, it's also very fast. What we call VD, which is the demonstrated flight diving speed, was um, 500, no, no, 460 knots, which is out of a speed. And yet out at 460 knots, at uh, 15,000 feet, it flew like a bird. The roll rates were high. There was no buffet. You could also take it to 9.5 Mach number at high altitude 
and pull a lot of G at 9.5, the wing never buffeted. It was a beautiful wing. But you see, it was that wing which pitched up at high incident. You can't have everything in this world. Mm. You can have nearly everything, but not everything. What was in the design of the wing that gave it that quality, basically? Ah, uh, well, I don't know. It, it, it's a mixture of sweep and wing section. Mm. And when it gets to high incidence, it wants to keep on pitching up instead of pitching down. Did so, it have any fences or anything to, to keep the... No, I don't think it did. Down. No, the 7-2 didn't. Mm. Anyway, when we went back and flew it, it worked the stick pusher worked perfectly and we were happy to accept the aeroplane and it flew with Dan Air for some time. Now, the twist in the tale of this story is this little bit. There was a 200 series that Dan Air wanted to operate. So, we flew the 200 which had, it had a pusher on it, the, the development aeroplane in the States and we flew that and it was perfect. So we came back and we wrote a report and we said, yeah, this is great and it's got to have this, that and the other. Now then, there was some clever chap, he used to work for Vickers, was advising Dan Air, and he said, look, don't accept what Davis is saying about this bloody stick pusher. Fight him, have a go at it. On the grounds that the record of the aeroplane, regardless of the flying qualities, the record of the aeroplane is proof that it is good enough, regardless of what the book says. Now, there is a basis in airworthiness requirements for saying that, an equivalent level of safety. If you can actually produce an aeroplane and say, look, regardless of all those words of yours, this aeroplane has flown for a million years and it's never caused anybody any trouble, you would have to certificate it. But, unfortunately for everybody, 1727 in service went in. in so a, the 200, was it? It was an American one without a pusher. Mm. That's all that matters. Mm. It was a 727 on the American register without a stick pusher. Now, I'll describe that accident very briefly. Two pilots and a flight engineer took off in a hurry. They were going to pick up, out of Boston, I think, on a very dirty night, they were going to pick up a football team somewhere. They climbed out of Boston. Now, if I tell you what happened, not what they thought happened, it'll save time. They forgot to put the pitot heat switches on. So as they went through 15, the pitot heat froze up. Now, when you freeze up, the pressure in an airspeed sensing system and you keep climbing, the static continues to fall so that you will get an indicating increasing airspeed in spite of the fact that you are not flying any faster. This is what happened to this aeroplane. The indicated airspeed started to increase, so the pilot flying the aeroplane pulled the stick back. It still started to increase, so he pulled it back more. It still kept increasing, and he thought, Christ, of course, he should have been looking at the attitude indicator as well, but he wasn't, until he got to about 22,000 feet, and he was right up like this, and the stick shook. Stall warning. Now, he should have recovered the aeroplane, in spite of the fact, and this is, it must have been very confusing for him, and I've got great sympathy. He was looking at 400 knots on the airspeed indicator, with the stick shake going. Now, because of the coincidence of that, the co-pilot was flying it in the right seat. The captain said, and he was as thick as the co-pilot, he said, for Christ's sake, he said, that's a high mark Buffett, the stick shake. He confused it with high mark Buffett. Now, what he didn't know, which I told you ten minutes ago, is that the 7-2 doesn't have any high mark Buffett. It's as clean as a whistle. So, he said to the co-pilot, pull it up. He thought they were doing that, you see. Whereas, actually, they were like that. And, of course, the co-pilot pulled it up. And it stalled. It went into a deep stall. They knew then what had happened because the machine started to sink. And when they came through about 14 or 12,000, they actually called the tower, you know, the ground and said, we've had it, we're in a deep stall and we can't get out. And they went in. Now, that happened at 13 million hours total on the Boeing 727 fleet. Now, if you remember what I said earlier, that you shouldn't have an accident more frequently for a single cause than one in ten to the eighth, which is a hundred million, they had one at thirteen million. And when you remember the scatter of one in ten to the seventh, even one at thirteen million doesn't prove one in ten to the seventh in ten million. So armed with that information, I went back to my council, and for the first time in my life, I had a big row with them. They were all there, all these guys, and 
they weren't like the old council. See, the old ARB council had people like Hanley Page and Lord Brabham and all these very senior people who were willing to put their company interests aside and deal with the matters properly and fairly. But when the ARB was sucked into the CAA, we got all the second line people. Instead of getting all the managing directors and the chief designers, we got all the assistant managing directors and all the assistant designers and all these flabby bloody people who were much more concerned with seeing that their aeroplane or their airline got away with things instead of thinking of their primary responsibility of safety and airworthiness. So when the case was put to them that the 7-2 had demonstrated a sufficient record, regardless of the fact that, and I say it again, it has a fatal storm characteristic at RCG, they decided to certificate it without the pusher. Not only that, they said, if we certificate this, we can take the pusher off the 100. I nearly went mad. I went along to this meeting, and I'm amazed I wasn't thrown out, or fired even. I called them everything under the sun. But it was no good. Conway, Hugh Conway, do you remember Hugh Conway? He was leader of the technical committee, and he opposed me. He and I didn't get on, because although he was a big knob, he was actually a bit of a coward, and I mean that. He lacked courage to take a decision and be responsible for it. It's the difference between a man who is happy to act alone and a man who is only happy to be part of a committee where he can shelter behind everybody else, you see, because all committee members shelter behind each other. I think a committee, the philosophy of a committee, is the worst thing ever adopted for management. What you need is, is one benevolent, marvellous dictator to run everything. But they, they wouldn't have it. And it's I an ironic them. footnote in that Conway died in an air crash, didn't he? In the, in the Turkish DC-10. Did he? Yeah. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah. Anyway, they said they were going to certificate it. Now, I got hold of Bill Strang, who followed Russell at Bristol on Concord and all that. And I said, look, Bill, you can't do this. And he said, look, I'm stuck in a hole, in effect. I said, but look. To, lo to have a fatal accident of 13 million hours doesn't prove um, one in 10 million. And I said, and what are you doing at one in 10 million? You were supposed to be working at one in 100 million. I said, you've just agreed the certification of Concord based on no single failure more frequently than one in 100 million. And he said, ah, oh, but this machine... I said, look, I give in. I said, if you not certificate this aeroplane, you do it without my blessing. And he said, well, what are you going to do then? I said, I'm going to write to the boss. He said, who's the boss? I said, well, it's one of these funny senior blokes up in London. So I did. But it was Mike Vivian, I remember his name now, but he was as weedy as the rest. See, they're all weedy when it comes to this. And I, I wrote him a letter, an official letter, and I said, our council are going to certificate this aeroplane without a pusher. And I'm telling you that it shouldn't be done because it doesn't meet the requirements. It doesn't meet the American requirements. It's got a fatal stall characteristic at RCG. But they put it all aside. And now since then, all those people, there were 18 of them, they must have spent their lives walking around their fingers crossed, hoping that no British registered 7-2 would ever go in due to a stall. Now 7-2s have gone in. Do you remember? Dan Air put one into the mountain in the Azores. But of course that was a, a nav error. They did a holding pattern in the wrong place and flew into the mountain. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's the story of the 7-2. I think it's an appalling story mm -hmm. that the UK certificated an aeroplane directly in face of a good set of requirements with a fatal stall characteristic. And if a 7-2 ever does go in at RCG with a boatload of passengers, there'll be the biggest bloody row you've ever heard of. Now, is that... The 100 series? It's both. Both? They, 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 neither were they eventually fitted with stick pushers? Well, the 100, remember, yeah. did have a pusher yeah. for three or four years yeah. until Dan Air wanted the 200. Yeah. The argument came up on the 200. It was decided not to fit it. Yeah. They didn't, and then because it wasn't on there, they took it off the 100. Yeah. So that, that's the 727 story. Yeah. I am ashamed of it except that my record is clear. There are notes and letters from me 
in the CAA, and of course they all end up in the public records office at Kew, which will say that the authority is certificating this blasted aeroplane flatly against my recommendations. 